Thank you, Tim and Marilyn and Sue. Good evening, church. That, all, that song always reminds me of being in prison. It does. It really does. Uh, when we used to go and preach and do church in, in the jail, say I should say jail, in Denton, Texas, that for some reason the guys loved that song. They just loved it. And they, uh, they would sing. We'd be in a room with about 75, 80 guys for a couple of hours and do some singing and some preaching and some praying and some crying and some ministering. And it was really good. It was, uh, I, I, look, uh, I look back on it fondly. But when they sang that song, it just came from the heart. You know, they felt like they were in prison and, and they didn't want God to, to uh, pass them by. All right, last Sunday night we were talking about um, marriage, uh, particularly LG, Christian marriage and LGBT. And uh, I was using the uh, little booklet that I've just written called Christian Marriage, A Mystery Revealed. And uh, the appendix in this booklet is about uh, the debate that is happening in our culture now uh, regarding the, the relationship between L the LGBT movement and um, Christianity. There are some people who are beginning to say that uh, Christianity should simply change its ideas about the sexual ethic, human sexual ethic, and embrace uh, LGBT ideas and um, accept that as, uh, as right. Stop saying that it's sinful, at the very least, uh, and implying that, it's, uh, that God is not happy with it. And uh, so this debate has been raging for a while. It hasn't, uh, it hasn't gone away, probably isn't going to, for a while. And so one of the reasons that I wrote this booklet was to look again very carefully at what the Bible has to say about marriage and what, why marriage is important. And marriage, we find in the Bible, uh, as believers particularly, is not just something that God has given us to make us happy. Marriage is not just something that God has given us as a foundation for our culture. Although both of those things are still true, uh, God expects us to enjoy our marriages and to reap the benefits and the blessings from marriage. And when we do marriage properly, uh, then we have a, a, uh, a stronger culture, uh, a stronger foundation to build our culture on. But there's more to it than that. Those things would be true even for unbelievers. For believers, marriage is more than that. For believers, marriage is a a picture of the relationship that God has with his people. In the New Testament, that's Jesus and the church. Jesus being the bridegroom, the church being the bride. Now, that doesn't mean that every individual person is, uh, is a separate bride to Christ. It means the church in toto is the bride of Christ, but our individual marriages, those of us who are called to be married, are uh, to be such that they are a living parable of the relationship, the love relationship between Christ and the church. So we, we should shoot higher in marriage uh, as believers. We should see our marriage as a, as a special calling, as something that is not just for us. Uh, it is something that benefits the church, it benefits the culture, and it brings glory to God. It brings glory to God. Uh, yes, there are still personal dynamics involved in marriage, but it's, it's far more than that. So we were looking at the, um, uh, the appendix that I put in the back, and uh, I was talking about responses to those who say that uh, the, Bible is, uh, the Bible can be reconciled to the LGBT lifestyle. And I won't go over what I've already said. If you weren't here, you can read uh, you can read the arguments in the, that I've put into the end, but we, we had made it to about page 74, and we were talking about the section that I entitled, put the subtitle, What to Do. What should we do about all of this? Uh, and the first thing I, I put down is prayer. As believers, you know, prayer should come to our mind first on a lot of issues. And the two things that I give here as responses have been uh, ridiculed and made fun of uh, in our culture. Uh, the, to pray about struggles with uh, sexuality has been, um, has been called praying away the gay. Oh, you're going to pray away the gay. And, it's, of course, it's a derogatory statement. 
that's meant to make fun of those who believe in prayer and believe in the power of prayer and believe in the power of prayer even to the extent of being able to change um, a person's sexual orientation. The good news is that more and more people are uh, around who say that that's exactly what's happened uh, in their life. Uh, and so as, the, as we go forward in this, we'll get more and more evidence of what happens when uh, a lot of people try an alternative lifestyle. And it turns out that it, it wasn't for them. They simply did it because the culture was uh, championing it, and it seemed like the right thing to do. The second thing that I put is celibacy. And, well, that's not popular in culture either. You know, uh, you, don't, you don't even hear about that uh, in our culture. Uh, sexuality is something that is a right, uh, it's a given, uh, and people should be able to express it in any way they want to. It's just where our culture is. Sadly, uh, historically, that's where a lot of cultures were as they um, went down uh, at the end. You know, they began to indulge themselves in a lot of different things, including sexuality, uh, and to get rid of the boundaries and the lines. Uh, things like discipline uh, just went by the wayside. And so uh, many, many uh, as those of you who are familiar with history know, many, uh, many empires were not defeated from the outsides. They were what? They decayed from the inside. You know, it's like uh, if you've seen a, a tree uh, that fell, uh, a large tree that fell, and then you go up and look closely, and you go, oh, my goodness, this tree is hollow. Uh, it was going to fall any day, but it looked just fine uh, on the outside. But once it fell, you realize there wasn't anything really holding it up. Uh, I hope that our culture hasn't gotten that far, but definitely we can see that we're moving in that direction. So celibacy is just not taken seriously, unfortunately, in our culture, but the Bible does take celibacy. Uh, important. We've talked about it in here before. Uh, there is a great deal of, uh, of psychological, physical, mental energy that goes into maintaining a sexual relationship. And if that energy is redirected uh, towards something else, it's amazing. Uh, it's amazing what, what can be done. And so people who are uh, called to be single or are in a, uh, a, a season of life where they're single, they have a lot of energy uh, that would have been expended on a relationship that's not being. And in the Bible, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, as believers, uh, that is supposed to be used to benefit God, to bring glory to God. So we see in the Bible that whether you're married or single, your, your, your sexuality or your celibacy Either way, is supposed, ultimately, to be used to bring glory to God. Uh, and so that's what, that, that's what we have in common, whether we're married or single, uh, that that part of our life is, uh, is earmarked, if you will, to be used for God's glory. So we made it this far, and then Maurice asked a question uh, that I thought was really good because he's asking about the language that we're using. Uh, and uh, language is important, words mean things, and we want to say the right things. Do you remember the question that you asked, Maurice? Not really. Not really. I, if I, you correct me if I'm wrong, but he said, why don't we, isn't it true that it's just unnatural? Why don't we just say it's unnatural? And we're done with the, the discussion, it, we're, it's over, let's move on to the next subject, you know. I love Maurice, he's a, he's a uh, let's get it over with and move on to the next thing kind of guy. I had a friend years ago, we were talking about pastoring, and I said, well, I'm, I'm the kind of pastor that likes doing counseling. I love to have somebody come into my office and have the opportunity to help them with the struggle they're going through, particularly couples, spend the time that it takes to understand uh, where they're at and and to help them find biblical uh, answers to their questions. And, and this friend of mine, I don't even remember who it was now, said, well, I, I could never do that because uh, I just tell them to straighten up and act right, and I don't understand the rest of that, you know. Well, what is all the point of that? I'm looking at Blake. Blake is the same kind of guy right there, just straighten up and act right. Yeah. So, so Blake and Maurice are not going to be opening a counseling service anytime <laughs> anytime soon, unless you want to pay very little money for it, you know. They can take care of you in about five minutes. Yeah. Oh, are, you, are we saying that Paul is the same way? 
I'm sorry. Okay, Paul has his hand up. I think we lost your point, Paul. Was... <laughs> okay. Right. Absolutely. Okay. So, and if you'll recall that, I think that's what Jennifer said right at the very end, that all sin should be unnatural to us. It is, but we don't think that it is, unfortunately. Jack? It, that's true, and we're going to come to that in Romans chapter 1 um, very, very quickly, and we'll talk about that uh, that goes back to Paul saying in 1 Corinthians that there is something unique about uh, sexual sin. He says all other sins are on the outside. Uh, sexual sin sends somehow to our, our spirit, to our soul. It's, it gets inside of us somehow. Uh, and so, you know, in, in a, a, a kind of a, a, an odd way, those who are uh, pro-LGBT, they see, uh, one of the things that they do see clearly is that sexuality does have a lot to do with our, um, our self-image, our identity, uh, and, and now we would disagree with what they say that identity is, but they are, they're right in saying that this is an important part of our life, and it is, it's an important part of our identity. We want to make sure that we identify in a way that is in accordance with uh, God's words. So uh, I would agree with that. Yes, Kay? Okay, absolutely. Now, what's really sad, though, in our culture, and I know that um, you've noticed this, is that to uh, engage in sexual activity outside of marriage is so accepted now that we are becoming uh, really just odd birds in, in many ways. Uh, Yeah, I didn't mention the uh, actual issue this morning because I didn't want to divert attention from what we were talking about, but many of you understand that that is the issue that is tearing the Methodist church uh, apart right now, that some believe that the church should accept uh, practicing LGBT. And we have to we want to be careful that we un, uh, make ourselves clear that if a person is gay or lesbian uh, and they have decided to deny that part of themselves and be celibate in order to uh, bring glory to God, then we accept that. We, we, uh, we pray that God will make their life easier, but we, uh, we honor them for that. Anybody who fights sin, uh, we need to run right in and, and hold their arms up, you know, and, and help them out so that they can continue uh, to be successful. So we don't just automatically turn our back on someone because they have those, uh, those desires. We all have desires for sin, uh, and uh, we, we would pro probably all be embarrassed if suddenly all of our desires were out there for everyone to see uh, and know about. What we're against, what we, the people that we really want to, we want to change their mind are those who are practicing 
uh, those lifestyles, and especially those who are practicing those lifestyles and saying that they can, it can be done in harmony with uh, Christianity. Somebody else had, uh, yes. No, they've been in this room. Yeah. No, I, we, if we started sending sinners out the door, we'd all be in trouble. Um, uh, and even if we just limited it to sexual sin, you know, we'd still, still be a lot of people in trouble. So uh, remember what Jesus said, if you look at a woman uh, and lust after her, then you've committed adultery with her uh, in your heart. So the, the, the stakes are high here. Uh, the, this is one of the things that distinguished it, that uh, distinguished Christianity in the first century. We've got to get back to this. It's good for us to know this history. In the first century, Rome was in many ways like the United States is now. They, they had lost control of uh, human sexuality, uh, and it was just acceptable. You know, it, it was acceptable that men had, well, they've got wives to have families, they have concubines to have sex, uh, and they go down to the corner uh, uh, temple and have sex uh, to worship the gods. And, and that was just, uh, it, it was, a, you know, you wink your eye and everybody understands and, and we go on, on our way. Uh, the homosexuality and so forth, it was just all proliferating. And the Christian church came on the scene in the first century and had a completely different idea of human sexuality. And frankly, a lot of people were drawn to that because the Roman culture had, the Greco-Roman culture, I should say, had gone so far down the road that a lot of people had reached the point where they were disgusted with what was happening. They saw the destruction of the family. They saw the destruction of the institutions and the organizations that had made, uh, not, that had made Rome strong generations before that, before it became uh, the empire. And... That's a sign that we haven't gone that far yet, uh, but one of the things that we've got to be ready to do is distinguish ourselves as Christians. We must be different from the culture that's around us. And if we're accepting these things, then we're just blending in uh, and we're not different. There's no distinction between us and the culture. We need that. Uh, so the two things that I put here are, yes, prayer is important. If a person claims to be a Christian, uh, I don't care what their sin is, they cannot make fun of prayer. And so I would submit to you that those who are making fun of prayer, they're, they're either deceived or they're not really Christians in the first place. Prayer is, at the, prayer is, the, is the stack pole of our faith. It's at the heart of our faith. Um, we always go to prayer first, no matter what. And secondly, um, celibacy, we should not make fun of celibacy either, and we should never count it out. We should always consider the fact that God has called some people, maybe for a lifetime, maybe for a season, uh, to be celibate for whatever reason that he's uh, chosen them to do that. And uh, we should teach our young people that uh, they should learn to practice celibacy before they get married. Um, all of that is a, a much more healthy Sexual ethic for a lot of different reasons that I don't have to tell you because, because you, you know them. So, what about using the term natural? Well, early in this book, I point out that uh, I have gone away from using the term traditional when it comes to defending biblical marriage. And the reason that I did is because traditions are things that are made by cultures and societies. And traditions only exist because they've been there for a while. And traditions change. That's exactly what we're watching happen right now. The tradition in our culture for human sexuality isn't changing. It's changed. If you think it's changing, you're behind. Because it's already happened. Uh, that train has left the station. We are now in a different and a new world. Uh, and one of the things that it will change is how we raise our children uh, and our grandchildren, because they are going to be taught in the world that uh, this, this uh, LGBT, life, LGBT and whatever else gets added to it, lifestyle, um, is right, it should be accepted, and it shouldn't be questioned uh, at all. 
Uh, that brings up a whole nother issue of freedom of speech, uh, that just, which is another thing that is just going in the wrong direction. You know, if you question certain things now, you're automatically labeled as hate speech, uh, and people don't want to listen to you anymore, which tells me that the people who uh, are accusing others of hate speech are insecure in their beliefs in the first place. One of the things that we've understood as a people that's made us unique as Americans uh, since, uh, since we established this country is that we believed in a vigorous political debate that people should be enabled to come out and say what they really believe, what they really think, even though it may be offensive to other folks. Because what happened in the old world is that people were controlled. They were told what to think. They were told what to say. And if they thought the wrong thing and if they said the wrong thing, they found themselves in the stocks. And if they continued, they might find themselves uh, with their innards falling out on the ground. You know, horrible, horrible things happened uh, in the old world. Once you begin to tell someone that they're hateful and you believe that they're hateful, then it's just a few more steps that you begin to eradicate that person and to silence them. And when we came here, we did things differently. We came here and we said, we're going to say that a person is free to speak their mind to say what they believe in. And if they're all by themselves and nobody else agrees with them, so be it. They can stand over there in the corner and say whatever they want to. We won't silence them. We won't use the power of politics and the government to silence people simply because of what they believe in uh, and what they say. That's changing. It, it has changed, and it needs to be countered vigorously. You know, if people are going to talk about hate speech, we need to talk about love speech. We need to, we need to de define what love speech is uh, and counter this concept of hate speech. Love speech is willing to tell the truth. It, do, it, it does so in a nice way, you know. Uh, it may not always be easy to hear. John the Baptist wasn't easy to hear. You know, John the Baptist was pretty intense. Uh, and, and so sometimes, sometimes debate is vigorous. Uh, that's okay. What's not okay is to use violence. It's not okay for either side to use violence. All right? that, that's where uh, you've stepped over the line. But if one side uses violence and then the other side also returns with violence, then we've started this vicious cycle uh, and we're in trouble. Someone has to stop and say, no, we don't do violence. That's, that's what we came here for. We debate. We don't assassinate. Michael? Somebody tell me what he said. That's exactly right. Thank you. Hate speech itself is being equated with violence. And that is violence to the human, I mean, excuse me, that is violence to the English language. That's redefining words. There's a difference between speech and violence. Uh, and if we're going to blur those words, then we're changing the meanings of words. Uh, and we shouldn't do that. Uh, words mean things. They have definitions uh, for, for a reason. So why don't I use the word natural? I have nothing against the word natural. I have nothing against saying that certain things are unnatural. Uh, but because of, the, uh, because of the, the nature of the debate, Maurice, and, and people saying, well, that's natural for me, I've just given up on the word. Uh, what natural really means to us as believers is that it is in accordance with the way that God made the world. That's, what, that's how we would define natural, is anything that happens in accordance with the way God created nature or made the world. When we're, when we're working uh, with nature, then we're working with God's design. And so by using the word nature, um, it, it sort of cuts out a mention of God in my mind so I would prefer to say God's design than to use the word nature, even though I would agree with using that word. Does that answer the question? <laughs> Maybe. His question, though, brings up one other thing that I want to mention before we leave this. We're talking about ethics. We're talking about what we believe is right and wrong and how we decide what is right and wrong. Of course, as believers, as Christians, we go right straight to God's Word. But that still doesn't answer every question. 
there are, um, one way of looking at ethics is that there are two approaches. One is principle, and the other is pragmatism. And the way this works is, principle says that you do the right thing no matter what the outcome. Even if there's a bad outcome, if you know what the right thing is, you just do it. Pragmatism says, if, do, if following the rule brings the wrong outcome, then you break the rule so that you get the right outcome in its extreme form. Well, let's talk about that for a minute. Can we come up with any examples in the Bible where the, um, the pragmatic approach was adopted and endorsed by God rather than the principled approach. In other words, where somebody broke a rule so that it would bring the right outcome and God said, in this case, that's right. That's exactly the one that I had in mind. The midwives in Exodus chapter 1, what rule did they break? Well, that was, that was a, an Egyptian rule, you know. But they lied, so they, they broke God's rule by not telling the truth. Now, the, the person who is the staunch principalist, they would have said, look, we just got to tell them the truth and see what happens. Uh, we've just got to tell Pharaoh that we're disobeying his, his rule. And the midwife, but the midwife said, no, this is, they saw the bigger picture, uh, and so they lied to Pharaoh in order to protect the firstborn uh, of the Israelites, and God blessed them. Can you think of another example? Oh, yeah. Are you talking about when Abraham lied about Sarah being his wife, or... Okay, all right, I, I hadn't thought about that one. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that one. Amy? Woo, that's another issue, yeah. Okay, you, your, your mind has moved in another direction, that's, yeah. Well, the example that I had in mind is related to war, and it's uh, Rahab. Remember, uh, the spies, she, she lied so that the spies could get away. So it's a, like, uh, a lot like the midwives. So it, and it, we, we have examples in the Bible, my point is, of both pragmatism and principle being endorsed by God. And so that kind of complicates things. <laughs> so coming back to the natural and uh, Maurice and LGBT so the some people just adopt a sort of a pragmatic approach to life you know um, back in the 1960s they had a phrase for that some of you in here are old enough to remember that. If it, if it feels good, do it, yeah. Um, and so it becomes anthropocentric. It becomes human-centered. You know, we, we are the final arbiters of what's right and wrong because we decide what's right and wrong based on what makes us feel good. Uh, and, and I think that still probably defines our culture really in a lot of ways. When the If It Feels Good, Do It uh, movement began in the 1960s, it really took hold in our culture. And I don't think it's ever gone away. You may not hear that phrase, uh, and, but the idea is certainly still with us. You only live once? Yeah. Yeah. So um, that, is, uh, that is the discussion about Christian marriage and LGBT to date. 
uh, unless anybody else wants to say anything or add anything at this juncture. It is warm in here. I don't yeah, Charles? How did compromise get into it? Oh, how would compromise get into it? Well, I, I don't know. I think um, there, there is no compromise when it comes to uh, the, the, the design for human sexuality, for marriage. Uh, but there are, um, there are certain exceptions that take place. For instance, we don't think that single parenting is the best way to raise kids, but there are some cases when uh, if somebody's raising a child and their spouse dies uh, and they don't feel called to remarry, then they will be a single parent. And so uh, we wouldn't want to look down on that person and say that they are cursed or that they're doing it wrong uh, or, or whatever. Uh, but in a culture that embraces the idea that children are better off being raised by both biological parents and makes sure that that is the rule and not the exception, then single parenting and parenting by grandparents and so forth is going to be the exception and not the rule. Uh, and so the entire culture is going to be stronger. Now, that's a pragmatic argument, and I admit it. Uh, it's a pragmatic argument for the biblical design uh, for marriage. Yeah, Charles. Absolutely, um, uh, and that always makes me think of uh, drinking alcohol. Uh, you know, some of the pastors here in town, uh, I'm getting together with them right now to meet with our leaders in Camden about a, uh, an ordinance that was put, put forward and now has been pulled back, but it's going to be put forward again to uh, allow for um, uh, drinking uh, open container uh, da downtown. And so the whole issue of, of drinking alcohol has come back to my mind. Uh, and for me personally, drinking alcohol is something that I believe can cause somebody else to stumble. I, I drank for years when I was younger. Um, I would have told you I was drinking responsibly at the time. And, uh, and I always had a job. You know, I didn't end up in an institution, uh, but I probably didn't, didn't do things right all the time either. And certainly when I got serious about uh, following the Lord Jesus Christ and particularly getting into ministry, I began to see things very differently, and I started to think the way you just talked about Paul, in that, you know, maybe I could drink uh, if I really wanted to. The Bible never just comes right out and, and says that you, should, you, you shouldn't drink. Uh, it certainly comes right out and says I shouldn't, we shouldn't be drunk. Uh, but even though the Bible would allow me to drink, I choose not to uh, because I don't want to cause somebody else. Well, yeah, this is uh, this goes back to what we're talking about with, with um, marriage. As Christians, we see our lives as more than just something that we're uh, using to make ourselves happy. Uh, we're connected to the, to the world. We're connected to um, one another. What I do affects you. What you do affects me. And so I don't just think about myself when I make decisions uh, about my personal ethic and my personal behavior. I think about how it's going to reflect on the church and how it's going to reflect on, on, on Christ. Yes, I think you have to compromise your belief in God's word to emphasize the truth of God's Yeah, so we'll go back to your original question. You, uh, something about compromise, what would the compromise be? Was that what you asked, Charles? Yeah, I, I don't... Um, I don't see it as compromise. I see it as, Tammy said, as showing sympathy and love and empathy. Uh, well, that's very good. Jennifer says sometimes we confuse compromise with compassion. And we can be compassionate without compromising. 
Absolutely. So I, I think that one, one of the things that's very important for us to remember who uh, this whole LGBT thing may seem completely alien to a lot of us. Uh, and, and so we need to remember that it's, there are real people with real struggles and we need to demonstrate real compassion. But that doesn't mean compromising what we believe. Uh, absolutely. All right. Uh, Romans chapter 1. We're gonna, I wanted to show you something that I didn't have time to talk about this morning. Uh, it is in chapter 4. Romans chapter 1, verse 4. Romans chapter 1, verse 4 has this word orizo in it, which I suspect every English Bible in here says declare or declare past tense. Does anybody have anything other than declare? Kathleen? What, which one are you reading? Yes. Well, that must be a change in one of their editions because the ESD that I looked at said uh, declare. But the 2011 NIV surprisingly says a point. Um, and a lot of good things were done in the 2011 NIV. Uh, not all of them good. Let me talk to you about what's happening here. Uh, this word or rezo uh, only occurs eight times in the New Testament. And it's really, its fundamental meaning is to appoint. To appoint. Now stop and think for a minute about what the difference between appoint and declare is. If we declare something, we're talking about something that was probably already a fact. If we appoint somebody, we're, it's new, we're changing their status somehow. Okay, so bear that in mind as we look at this. So here we have this word orizo or horizo, and it's it really its its main meaning is a point. You can really, really twist its arm behind its back and stretch it real hard, maybe, and get declared out of it. So why do so many English Bibles have the word declare if that's really an inferior reading, if a, uh, if a point would be a better reading? Um, look at the verse. Appointed Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness from the resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now just guess, why do you think uh, why do you think somebody who's an Orthodox Christian would avoid using the word appoint there? Because that would say he was not always the Son of God. That's exactly right. Uh, because it could sound like that Jesus was not always the Son of God that he was being appointed the Son of God when? To the power of resurrection. At his resurrection. So that this, in this way of looking at it, Jesus, before he was resurrected, he was just a man like, like you and me. Uh, and there was nothing unusual about him at all. But God chose him uh, at the resurrection and then appointed him to be the Son of God. So he was not the Son of God in eternity past. He may be the Son of God in eternity going forward, but there was a time when he was nothing more uh, than a man. Now that is not, I hope I don't need to say this out loud, but I will, that is not orthodox Christianity. And that is not what the Bible teaches. It's not what Paul teaches in other places uh, in the Bible. And uh, probably the most obvious place that teaches the fact that Jesus was the Son of or at least that he existed uh, in turn to pass would be where? John 1. Yeah, John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And it doesn't use the, the actual use the word term or the term son, but we can put together these other scriptures, and it's pretty clear that Jesus didn't become the Son of God when he was resurrected. Now, that's actually a theological um, mistake, uh, a heterodox. Uh, heterodoxy that was taught uh, early in Christianity, in the second century, and it's flared up a couple of times throughout. And it's called adoptionism. Adoptionism. And it teaches that Jesus started out as a man, but then God at some point adopted him to be his son. 
Normally, adoptionists, though, don't think of Jesus as becoming the Son of God when he was resurrected. They normally teach that he became the Son of God when he was what? Baptized. Baptized. And you can see where they would get that from. You know, because when Jesus was baptized, what happened? The Holy Spirit comes down on him. Uh, and God suddenly makes this proclamation, this is my son, and so forth. So uh, that typically adoptionists, uh, or those who embrace this, this theology, uh, do so in relationship to the baptism of Jesus, not to his resurrection. Nevertheless, to avoid potential error, the uh, translators of our English Bible felt more comfortable uh, using the word declare. Uh, because declare makes it sound like you're just saying something that already was. You know, he was declared the Son of God at the resurrection. He didn't become the Son of God. He wasn't appointed the Son of God. Yes. Yeah, resurrection. Okay. So that's the new thing. Once he was, once he was sacrificed, man, he died on the cross and turned around, and then he received grace by and through his sacrifice, and therefore he did the point. Well, you're exactly right in focusing on the sequence of events. She's talking about when we receive the grace of God, uh, that that comes after the resurrection, right? So, uh, and the sequence is important here. Uh, that uh, this is talking about a, the sequence that happened in Jesus' life, that he humbled himself, as I mentioned this morning, which is so eloquently expressed in Philippians chapter 2. Don't you love that passage? Who being in very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him, and so forth and so on. So what we have there is we have the humiliation of the Son and the exaltation uh, of the Son. Yes, sir? So that passage also confirms that he was already... Absolutely. Who being in very nature of God did not consider it all. Right. It uses the word kanao, which means empty. He emptied himself. At some point of his. Thank you very much. So the first place in the New Testament that the word horizo uh, occurs is Luke 22, 22. If you want to flip back over there and look at that real quick, you'll see uh, where horizo. It's, it only occurs eight times in the New Testament. It's the first place. Uh, somebody, somebody read that to us nice and loud. Somebody's got a good loud reading voice. Luke 22, 22. That's how I remember it. Two, 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 two. Who's got it? You got it? Go ahead. For indeed, the Son of Man is going as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is afraid. Okay, where is the word hurry, though? Has been determined. Has been determined. Exactly. Not declared. Determined. Okay? And that, that's, that's what this word means. You know, Jesus, the, Jesus', is, um, Jesus is crucifixion was determined in eternity past. You know, that was, that was another deal. He came to do that. He already knew that. Uh, and he, I came to give, he said, I came not to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. So that was, it was determined, not just declared, it was actually determined. So why is, is Paul saying here that Jesus was determined uh, or appointed to be the Son of God? Well, it's, it's, a, it's sort of a, a, a grammatical question. He wasn't appointed to be the Son of God. Look at the verse again. He was appointed to be the Son of God in power. Because he humiliated himself and became the Son of God in weakness. This is what this verse is about. It's about the comparison between Jesus in his humiliation and his weakness and Jesus in his power and his exaltation, which is the essence of Christianity. Once you see this little pattern that's in Philippians chapter 2, that's here in these two verses, 
You'll see it all over the Bible, all over the New Testament. Uh, this, is, this is the heart and soul of Christianity. Jesus Christ was exalted. He humbled himself. And that he exalted him, he is now exalted to the right hand of God. And by humbling himself and then being exalted again, when he came down and humbled himself, it's as if he jumped off the side uh, of the ship into the water where there were a bunch of people drowning. Uh, and by coming down into the water with us, he gathered a lot of us together. And when he goes back onto the boat, we go back onto the boat with him. So when he was exalted again to heaven, we were exalted with him. Uh, in God's eyes, we are, in Christ, exalted to the right hand uh, of glory. We're already there as far as he's concerned. Uh, it's a done deal uh, because of what Jesus, uh, what Jesus has done. And so this is, uh, any other understanding of Christianity is foreign uh, to these documents, is foreign to the apostolic gospel that they preached. Uh, and that the church was was uh, built on. And so we can see it here in these two verses. So he was appointed not son of God. He was appointed son of God in power. It's the power that is the appointment, not the fact that he was already the son of God. One other thing real quickly about this uh, verse. There, there's mechanics in this verse that make it seem pretty sure. We, we can never be totally sure about these things. That these two verses probably were a what we would call a praise song in the early church. Now, there are other places in the Bible that are also very, very clear. In fact, the quotation that I just gave you from Philippians chapter 2, a lot of people believe that was a praise song. They didn't call them praise songs. That's what we call them. But some kind of song that they sang uh, in the first century church. We're talking about the church, you know, 20, 30 years after Jesus was crucified. We're talking about the first gospel music. The original gospel music. I, I don't know about you, but I, I get excited about that. Uh, that. That we have these songs that are written into scripture uh, that give us an idea of the lyrics. All we're lacking is what? If we could just hear the harmony, you know. Uh, if we could just hear the melody. Uh, if we just hear what those songs sound like. I personally can't wait to hear uh, what the music sounded like uh, in, the, in, the, in the first year. What did the songs sound like? Even going back further than that, what did that music sound like? When David wrote a song and he sang it, and the musicians just got all of their instruments out, and they got together and they had a jam session in the garage, you know, what did that sound like uh, with David? I, I, I want to I hear that. I want to hear that. So these two verses, that may not excite you, but it does me. This is just one place in the Bible that may actually be an ancient praise song. Uh, and it, it shows a contrast between the, um, the humiliation of Christ and the exaltation of Christ, as does Philippians chapter 2. All right. Um, Revelation chapter 2, 20. The great white throne judgment. Next Sunday night. <laughs> Be there. Be there. All right, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father Heaven, we pray for you and thank you for the truth that you reveal to us in your word. We want to know it. We want to understand it. We want to embrace it. We want to live it. We want to obey the gospel. Help us, God, not just to understand with our uh, minds what it means, but to accept it fully and completely so that we're willing to act on it, to be the saints, as we read this morning, to live holy lives that reflect well on you. We thank you, God, for your Holy Spirit that enables us to do what we could never do on our own. And I ask for my brothers and sisters here tonight as we start a new week, God, that you would fill us with your spirit, that we would be able to walk in the power and the presence and the wisdom of your spirit this week in every circumstance and every situation, in our homes, in the community, in our jobs, wherever we might be, God, that we would represent you well and that you would bless us, God, with your presence and your power.